Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the Word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the Word. Now, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, oh, I love this scripture, hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15. He says, for we have not a high priest, praise God, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was at all points tempted like us. We are yet without sin. Hallelujah. And the next verse says, Let us therefore, because we have a high priest, he says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of what? Judgment. Hey, unto the throne of judgment. No, he says, let us come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I don't know how some scriptures deal with some of you, but there are some things I feel and I hear and I'm like, yes, this is too much love. Praise God. Now, the Bible tells us, so we have no the high priest. <laughs> Which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Which cannot be touched with the feeling of our weaknesses. The high priest you and I have, he's not the one which cannot be touched or is not touched with our weakness. If you think that the priest you have is he detached, you know, he doesn't care, you know, he doesn't mind about your weakness, he doesn't mind about your infirmity, he doesn't mind about your disease, he doesn't mind about what you're going through. That is not the man I am talking about. That is not even the Jesus I believe. The Bible says, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of uncertainty. But Bible says, but he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And the Bible says, and let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. You go to the throne of grace bold because you know the priest. He, he is touched. He, he is affected by your weakness. He knows your weakness. You even sang it in him. Jesus knows our every weakness. Did he say don't go to him? But he says no. Take it to. Are we weak and heavy love? Then, uh huh, covered with a lot of care. Uh huh, precious Savior, still a refuge. Take it to Hallelujah, somebody. The precious Savior is still your refuge. There is nothing you're going to do. Or have done before that is a shock to Jesus. News flash. He doesn't exist in your time series of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He's the same. You know, as today, yesterday, and tomorrow appear the same to him. You're not shocking him. And you didn't shock him either. He knew. But he says, But we don't have a high priest which cannot be touched by our weaknesses. He can be touched by our weaknesses. He is. He is affected by our feeling. Give me the amplified version of that, 15. He says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable, listen, to understand and sympathize. Hallelujah. He talks the word there is sympathize. To sympathize. And have, the Bible says, listen, a shared feeling with our weaknesses and infirmities and liability to the assaults of temptation. But one who has been tempted in every respect of the yet without sinning. Praise the Lord. Jesus is not indifferent with your weakness. He's not indifferent with what? With your liability. He's not indifferent with, with your infirmity. He has shared in everything. And he has been tempted in every respect. But the Bible says, but he did not sin. Somebody shout hallelujah. 
Some people have priests or speak of a priest which is not touched with our witness. The Jesus people have put on the altar is a priest who is not touched with men's infirmities, who is waiting to judge men, not waiting to love them out of witness. Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. That is not the Jesus that the Bible speaks of. Let me show you something interesting. Hebrews chapter 5. You, you, I think you, you must understand that this is Hebrews 15, right? Huh? And I want, you to, I want you to notice. Imagine there was no chapters and verses, okay? Imagine this was letters as Paul wrote them originally, and I know many of you are familiar with the fact that chapters and verses were put for reason of reference. But in the original manuscript, as they were given, there was no chapters and verses. You agree? Right? Now, if we go back to Hebrews chapter 14, 15, where we're at, probably can give you the case, maybe I can walk with that for time. He says, with not high a high priest, right, who, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but with all, with all points tempted, like we are yet without sin. And the next verse says, and let us therefore, he says, come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, some people close the chapter there because somebody closed the chapter there and closed the verses there. But if you remove the chapter and verses, you'll understand that Paul was writing a very intricate truth. And he continues in the fifth verse, the fifth chapter. Now, imagine there is no chapter and verse. He says, for every, you see that? For every, that means he's trying to explain something that has a relationship with what happened prior. He's trying to elucidate, he's trying to break down something that had a relationship with what he's explaining prior, before. So he says, for every, now let me explain that, for every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God. Okay? And he says that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. And the Bible says, who can have compassion on the ignorant, all right, and on them that are out of the way, for he was himself also compassed with infirmity. You see that? He was with himself compassed with infirmity. Meaning, when God gets a high priest, he gets a high priest among men for men toward God, for the purposes of, of relating with God. Actually, God has never wanted to deal with men personally on the issue of sin. That is why even the New Testament dispensation, Jesus becomes the mediator between man and God. In the Old Testament, it was the priests which were mediators between man and God. Not everybody went to God to repent. You remember? The Bible says priests went into the Holy of Holies every once in a year for the sake of the other, the rest of the Israelites. And then the shedding of the blood of the, of the calves, the bulls, and all these kinds of things. The Bible says when it was shed, the consciences of these men were purged. They were convinced that God does not count any sin on them. Yet in the Old Testament dispensation, sin was covered. It wasn't taken away because there was no sacrifice that would ever have been as worthy as the sacrifice of the Son of God. Somebody say amen. Are you following me? Now follow me very well. I don't want to lose you. Now, he has told us a mystery that every priest, if you're talking about a priest, taken from among men, the Bible says he is ordained or anointed for men in things pertaining to God, right? And that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. That means this priest is there, there's hundreds of people there, and this priest is ordained. God says, I need somebody to deal with when I'm dealing with a general sin of people. Are you following what I'm saying? And he says in the next verse, but this priest will have compassion. Why? Because he was gotten among men and he has his weaknesses too. And because he has his weaknesses, the Bible says he himself will be patient with the ignorant and those that error or go out of the way. Because he's also tempted like a man, like any other man. Do you understand what I'm saying? He was tempted. He knows what it's like to be tempted. So he will be patient with those who are tempted. When you tell me of a priest who is not patient with ignorant people, 
When you tell me of a priest who is not patient with people who err, that man is not a priest. He is not a priest. It's part of the stewardship of priesthood. It, it's the primary mandate of priesthood to be present with those that are slow to understand and those that err out of the way. I'm not saying that by that reason we should compromise. I'm only saying that even in there, the patience has to be there. That is why, for example, when we're dealing as priests, if somebody goes wrong, we sit them down first time. Somebody goes wrong, we take them again. Another person, we bring them there, we try to talk to them. They do it the third time, we get the three, four. We try as much as possible to see that we restore them because every priest must be patient with those that are ignorant and error out of the way. It's the patience of every priest. Every man of God must be patient with people. And sometimes people come to us and they want us to judge people next day. Apostle, that person did this. Fire them immediately. Do this to them. Tomorrow morning, if I were you, you're not me. That's why I'm here. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Listen, we don't compromise with sin. But we also understand. Because Jesus understands. You follow what I'm saying? Sometimes people abuse the patience of the Lord. The Bible speaks of men which despise the long suffering of God. Is it Romans 2 4? Knowing not that the goodness of God leadeth to repentance. Some people despise the, the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God is what leadeth thee to repentance. God is patient with you because he sees the end of your repentance. Your change of mind, metanoia. The priest, your priest is patient with you because he sees the end, which is your repentance. It's one thing for you to appreciate one's patience over you. It's another for you to despise his patience over you. There remaineth no reconciliation for men who despise the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long-suffering. Knowing not that that is what leads men to repentance. Men are repenting every day because God is long-suffering, he's forbearing, and he is good. I think it's somewhere in Hebrews 9. The Bible calls him the high priest of good things to come. You think about it. He is the high priest of good things to come. When they talk about Jesus, you, you think of the good things that are going to happen for you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Christ being come and high priest of Good things to come. He's a priest of good things to come. That, that, that's why you have hope for your future. Because every time you say, Jesus, you think of a good thing to come. Hallelujah. I, I, I am expecting good next year for you. I'm expecting good next week for you. I'm expecting good next month for you. Why? Because you have come to a high priest of good things to come. Some people question why our expectation is so up there. For you, you don't expect anything bad to happen. No, I changed the priesthood. Do you know there are people who are carriers of bad news? They're always thinking, expecting something bad to happen. Every time they're there. But what if this happens? But what if this happens? But what if, he, what if, what if, what if, what if? He says, why are you thinking like that? You know, recently the Lord has been telling me about the foolishness. Huh? The Bible says of this world. The Bible says the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. The way the world thinks and calls wise, it's foolishness to God. Don't do this. You know this. Don't. Yeah. Ah, this is what is. Why are you thinking that way? Why do you think that because you're going to invest in a business, it's going to die? Why do you think that way? Why do you think you're going to fail? Why do you think you're going to fail? Why do you think bad things are going to happen to you? Praise God. No, 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 no. The one thing every Christian should know and be is to always exercise your conscience. To be void of offense toward man and God. That's enough. Praise the Lord. God has not called us to a us. 
Hallelujah. But when you have a priest of good things to come, every time you think about your future, you only see good. Only good. Only good. I see good. I always see good. In the mighty name of Jesus. Somebody shout hallelujah. Now, I was telling you, the reason why, now Paul is explaining, the reason why this priest will have compassion with them that err or go out of the way and them that do not are ignorant, it is because that priest, the Bible tells us, also himself is dealing with infirmity and weakness. He knows. That's why I call out men of God, pastors, preachers, prophets, evangelists, and bishops who have become so holy when they are dealing with the weak. How could you do that? Oh my God, you, listen, man of God, you're weak too. Saved by the grace of God, you would be in the same boat. Am I preaching somebody? If it was not for the grace of God, man of God, you'd be in the same boat. That's why Paul asks you, what do you have that was not given you? So why do you boast as one who made it yourself? Why do you boast like you're the most straight person the world has ever seen? Have you been around pastors who are so holy? And this problem is with men of God mostly. And a few religious Christians. Who think that they are holier than the other one who made a mistake last week? And they're always like, oh, oh, you know that person. This person did this. No, priest, man of God. If you're from among men, you're weak too. Saved by the grace of God. Tell your neighbor, except by the grace of God. There's an American preacher I'll never forget. He passed. This man used to attack a certain weakness. And he was an ardent fighter of this weakness. He was an ardent prosecutor of them that were weak in the same weakness. He preached against it. He fought against it. He, he rallied people behind him to fight against this vice. And a couple of years later, the man was caught in the same vice. And I realized that maybe this man was fighting what he was struggling with by throwing it on others. I've realized that Christians who are very judgmental, 99% of them are struggling with the things they judge men others of. Many people who accuse others, many of them are dealing with the same issue they are accusing of others. But some have failed to reflect and therefore instead of pointing the finger to for seek help, they accuse others. I have seen it all the time. You read your Bible. Has there been a place where you've seen a speck in another man's eye when you don't have a log? Hello? You read your scriptures. Has there been a place where you've seen a speck in another man's eye when you've not had a log in yours? That person is a thief. Log. Log. Am I preaching to somebody? That is why I don't judge men. I don't judge men. Because with the same measure you judge, it shall be measured to you again, meaning you'll fall in the same issue. <laughs> Praise God. Am I helping somebody? Am I helping somebody? So this is why this high priest is slow. Give me the message of that. The Bible says that he should be able to deal gently with their fallings since he knows what it's like from his own experience. <laughs> I love God. From his own experience. That means this might not be a very popular statement to say, but no priest stands except by the grace of God. Without it, man of God, you're gone. Seek your own righteousness and think that you're better than anybody else. Within a few while, you'll be in trouble. We're all standing by the grace of God. I didn't do right yesterday because I'm a priest. 
I did right yesterday because the grace of God succored me. It aided me. It helped me. Now we have a problem with Jesus. Huh? We have a problem with Jesus. He's the son of God. 100% God. Born of God. Child of God. Created in perfection. He was the perfection of beauty. He's there. You see? The darling of heaven. The favorite of all. He's perfect. And now he has to come and save men from their own weaknesses. Hallelujah. From their own infirmities. If he came in the spirit without a flesh experience, he would not understand. It's as though he would not understand. Because he was spirit. He did not possess a body. That's why the Bible says in Hebrews 2 that it behoved him to be like unto his brethren. It impressed on him. 2.17. The Bible says, Wherefore, you know, think it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren. That is why Jesus comes in a body. Because if he has not experienced it, he cannot understand it. Are you following me? So it behoved him to be like unto his brethren, that he might be merciful. Again, you see, I'm faithful. A high priest in the things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Jesus was not qualified to take away our sin if he had not felt how we feel when we are weak. Who has understood what I just said? The Son of God was not qualified to take away our sin if he had not carried and bore our weaknesses and infirmities. That's why the Bible says it behoved him to be like unto his brethren. Until like you and I. Give me the message of that. The Bible says he had to enter every detail of human life. Oh, somebody sound hallelujah. He says he had to enter every detail of human life. Then when he came before God as a high priest, to get rid of the people's sins. He, he had to enter. And the next verse says, he would have already experienced it all himself. All the pain, all the testing, and would be able to help where he was needed. He was needed. Where he was needed. Do you hear that? Can we read it again? Read it from 17 again, the message. He says, that's why he had to enter into every detail of human life. Then, when he came before God as a high priest to get rid of the people's sins, the Bible says that he would have already experienced it all himself, all the pain, all the testing, and that would be able to help where help was needed. He had to feel it. When your body burns, Jesus knows how your body burns. He understands. And he is able to help you when you say you need help. About Uganda. Praise God. Praise God. Jesus knows. He knows how you feel when somebody angers you. And he is able to help you. Because he took on the likeness of a human being and came in the form of a servant. He could not come in the likeness of a servant. <laughs> he couldn't. He just had to take on the form. You understand? Jesus understands. That tells somebody, Jesus understands. Hey, you might be there and that nobody understands you. Now, hey, that one, had, we talked to her. We prayed for her. We counseled her. Apostle, we even paid for her. But the person refused to understand. I have good news for you. Jesus understands. I've ever been in a situation where nobody understands you. Do I have a witness? Now you've gone through something and you're like, but if I explain this to anybody, I'm too holy to be understood. I'm too worthy to be understood. Do you understand what I'm saying? And then some people go through things and then they kill themselves and some just throw up the towel and then they say, you know what, I'm done. Why? Because the world has made it look that way. 
The world has made men believe that there is no way through. Some people think that because your pastor doesn't understand, Jesus has stopped understanding. Good news for you. Jesus still understands. So when the Bible says that we don't have a high priest which is not touched with our witnesses, he was tempted in the same way. He's the one you go to and tell God, I screwed up and say, I understand. Do you need help? This is him asking you. I understand. Do you need help? And that's where, that, that's where the trick is. Because many Christians, they don't go to him for help. You know what they do? They help themselves. Translate that in Luganda, it's even more ugly. Filthy rugs. Do you understand what I'm saying? Instead of allowing God to help you, you say, oh, Jesus, I got this. I got this, man, I got this. Then you go your way. Praise God. You start treating yourself with every way. You start doing this and that and then... Mm, then again you fall harder. Then you come to Jesus and tell him now. <laughs> Can we do this again? Just say, hey, my man. I got this. I got this. Then you walk again in your life of salvation. Isn't it? You do everything right. And then in the middle, four times worse. Then you come back to him and tell him... <sighs> One more time. I promise. I promise. I promise. One time a young girl came to me for counseling and she said, Apostle, I told God if I mess up again, kill me. Guess what? I messed up. <laughs> I told her, what do you want with me? He's going to kill me. <laughs> Listen, Jesus helps those who need help. Not those who try to fix themselves. God has not called you to fix you. He has called you to let him fix you. He that began that good work in you, he shall see it to accomplishment to the day of Christ. Sometimes I see people struggle with things and I just have to remember what the word says. And I tell myself, she'll be fine. He will be fine. And guess what? Over the years, people start walking out of things. That's why I'm trying to tell people. Have you ever walked out of something that you one time were convinced there was no way you could come out of, and then you wake up and it has gone, and you're like, how in the world did this demon leave? That was the day you stopped trying and allowed him to walk through you. Brethren, you can never... Do it in your own strength. That's why we preach the grace. That's why we preach the grace. God finds a woman who has committed adultery. Okay? He without sin cast the first stone. They all walk away. Says, neither condemn I you. Go and sin no more. How is it possible for the Adamic nature not to sin? How? When it's begotten in sin. Was he telling her that from today on, and that's what legal people do. Was he telling her that from today on, don't sin really, do you, does she have the ability not to? Jesus was telling her, believe on me. He was simply telling her, there is no way, there is no way you can make it without coming for help. When he tells her, go sin no more. There is also a reality that there is no way she can sin no more. Why? Because she is in the Adamic nature. How can she not sin no more? Except if she believes in him that justifies the ungodly. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But he justifies them through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Somebody shout hallelujah. Jesus was trying to tell this woman, follow me. There is a mystery one day you will meet when you understand me. And you will know that it is by me that you cannot sin anymore. I thought that woman was going to ask Jesus, how can I not? But like many, 
she was grateful for that forgiveness and walked away without the answer of how to stay away. There was a self-righteousness. That woman, yes, was right to have gratitude to the master for forgiving her. But I wish she knew what you and I know now, that there was no way. But you see, because she saved by death, at that particular point, she's persuaded. Have you been around a place where you tell God, you know, God, I've messed up. If you get me out of this, this is this time, if you get me out of this, I will never do this stuff again. This, this time, I'll give my life to you. Praise God. I was told of a lady, somebody was telling me of a lady I know very well. <laughs> she had a sick person. And then this person was almost to death. And then she told God then, she was in Malaysia, she said, if you heal my person, I'll be a missionary for you in Africa. <laughs> God healed the person. <laughs> she has never stepped in Africa. She so doesn't even know how Africa looks like. Some of you have promised God many things. If you take me out of this, I will serve you. Up to today, you're still on Katebe. Lord, if, if you take me, get, God, get me a job, I swear I'll tithe. This time, I've seen it all. What, what haven't I seen? What, what more do I need to see? Really, God. Then you got money. <laughs> now I'm reminding you <laughs> that you have not tithed for five months. <laughs> you... Jesus, this time I think I'm done. I promise. Seriously, God. Look, look through. Here. Do you think I can do that anymore? With, with everything I have gone through. Am I so stupid to mess up? And the same person messes up. And you know what? When you mess up that way, there is no way you can look at the people you promised. Either you run away, flee. You understand what I'm saying? There's a young man I know, he, he promised I'm not drinking again. His dad did it again. I'm not drinking, then he did it again. First time, this time. Then he did it again. He took himself to rehab the next day. <laughs> he didn't even wait for them to take him. Why? He felt that he did that. He deserved to judge himself. But this is what God is trying to tell you. Every time you do it your way, you will fail. You will have a miserable fail. Praise God. He wants you to allow him to work through you both to do and to will according to his good pleasure. He says, so it is God which works in you both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. He is pleased in working in you and doing in you and willing in you. Why don't you allow him to take pleasure in working in you? Why do you put him aside and then try to work yourself out? If you have struggled with something and it has refused to leave, Go away yourself against the scale of self-righteousness and your own works. You realize that there's a legal aspect in your attempt to walk out. Grace never fails. Tell somebody, grace never fails. If you're struggling with something, chances are you're trying in your own human effort. But I, I, I embrace the grace. No, you did not. You did not. That part of you has not embraced it fully. If it does, Believe me, you will walk out. And somebody hears this and says, he's telling people to see. People have demons on them. These days I'm, I'm planning to deliver some people. Praise God. There's another way to deal with the religious spirit. You know in scripture, there's never written in the word where you, you can rebuke a religious spirit. They don't rebuke religious spirits. No. Even when Jesus met the religious, he didn't rebuke. He just said, woe unto you. He didn't rebuke them. <laughs> Hallelujah. Matthew 12, verse 20. He says, A bruised reed will he not what? Break. And a smoldering weak will he not quench. Till he brings what? Judgment and, and to victory. The Bible says, A bruised reed shall he not break. And a smoking flax shall he not quench. The Amplified says, A bruised 
read, he will not break and a smoldering or dimly burning wick. He will not quench till he brings justice and a just cause to victory. This is what God means. Maybe this person was on fire for God. And then this fire started to die out. And then they became dim. That's what they call a dimly burning light, a smoldering wick. You know what a wick is? That little thing that comes out of a, a lantern or something. Eh? And then the, the light starts to burn out. It's smoldering. That means it no longer has a flame, right? It's, it's, it's dim. It just has a, a, a reddish color on it. Like, you know, it's not a flame like it should be. There are people who are waiting for you to dim. And they'll even help you to burn out. Do you understand what I'm saying? Jesus is not like that. He finds you burning out and then he finds <laughs> the flame comes through. Do you know why I say that? I have been in the church long enough to see people who want to see you fail. They even speak like you're fallen already. They hope that you're fallen. Do I have a witness? Oh, that one knows. She, she's a gone story. There's nothing. No, that one, nah. That one, that one. It's only a matter of time. One man stood and said, that funeral, end of 2016, it's gone. If I'm a man of God. He said, if I'm a man of God, 2016, funeral is gone. God had it. And then he came on Panero. <laughs> the devil is a liar. Praise God. Hallelujah. The Bible says, For he has made himself to be seen for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He takes your place. Oh, what a love. He takes your place. That is why I prophesy upon your life. Those who think you have an end, they are about to realize that you have not even yet begun. In the mighty name of Jesus. If it had not been for the Lord, who was always on our side the enemy would have swallowed us would have drowned in the water <laughs> and our souls have found an escape a hiding place in you the foul of snare is broken. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Some of you, you reached somewhere and the week was out. And probably the only thing that was oozing out was smoke. And everybody knew the devil said, uh-huh, she's gone. And God came. <laughs> Michael, bring more petrol. <laughs> I mean the oil. I mean the oil. Hallelujah. Bring more oil. <laughs> Hallelujah. The enemy aims for your bad. And look at you. You're still standing alive and well. The Bible says he has not dealt with us. As we deserve. Brethren, Jesus has not dealt with us as we deserve. Why do you deal with men as they deserve? Sometimes I look at the weakness of humanity. And for a moment I think. If God was to turn our hearts upside down to show people who we really are in the flesh not in the spirit in the spirit we are perfect 
But if God was to open the kernel you, some of you are a million times worse than the people you've judged. But you don't even know. But God came to you. When the week was burning out and the breed was bruised and he fanned you up and said, I am not the kind who burns it out because I did not light it out to burn out. I didn't plant it to be bruised. I was bruised for it. I was wounded for it. The chastisement of my peace was upon him. By his stripes, you were healed. He speaks of you as a vineyard. And he says, if there's anything with you, you remember the message version? If they stop to deal with you, if they stones to get out of you, the Bible says he will get it out and continue with his vine. I am persuaded that I will finish well. I will finish well. Because I'm the Lord's own. Isaiah 27 verse 2. He says at the same time a fine vineyard will appear. There is something to sing about. I go do what? Are you the Lord's vineyard? Are you the Lord's vineyard? He says I the Lord tend it. I keep it well watered. I keep careful watch over it so that no one can damage it. And the Bible says, I'm not angry. I care. Even if it gives me thistles and thorn bushes, I'll just pull them out and burn those stones and bushes and I will continue with it. Because I need, God says, I need to tend my vine. That's why I tell people, when you are under grace, you never worry to fall. Some people have prophesied your fall. But they are only going to see your upward movement. Why? Because you're not standing in your own strength. You're standing in the strength and the ability of Almighty God. That is why they fall. Because they judge you. And every time you judge a man, you mean to say, for you, you have a way that that man doesn't have. You'd mean to say you're standing in your own strength, not the grace of God. Because if it is the grace of God, the Bible says, whereof is your boasting? Save in faith. You understand what I'm saying? There's no boasting when you know it's not your ability. No man right now walking right before God is doing it because they are strong. Please. If you think it's in your own strength, I promise you, by the time you leave this ground, you'll be fallen. Because God doesn't need minutes to prove to you that your righteousness is filthy rags. That your ability can end nowhere. You cannot go anywhere with your ability. That's why he became sin for us. Why don't we build a ministry? Why don't we deal with people as burning out for them that are weak why don't we be patient with people why don't we try to flame them when they're burning out why do we put that what when he's gone just give it to me now give it two days i know him he's this and that and, and you know what i have seen this all my life every time you set yourself against another person god will position them to be observed by you going up and you will see them up to a level where your words will never count because they are, you know, when you're moving in, in God, there's a place where you go so far, you understand, that the person talking about you has no consequence on you. There are certain people we left long ago. Long ago. You're not in their league, you're not in their class. Why? Because God is working in you. Listen. But it has not sunk yet. But it will. It will. Why? Because we have embraced the grace of God. Sometimes I look and I'm like, God, I didn't do this because of your grace. I did not do this because of your grace. I did not do this because of your grace. I didn't do this because of grace. Thank you for your grace. And I've realized that every time I lean more in his ability to work in me, I've realized this thing that brings a peace that takes off the weakness without even struggling with it. And I'm like, what a beautiful life. Now I think of the religious man who is standing in this way, 
Who is refusing a young man or a young woman to receive the good news? The Bible says they refuse others to get in and neither do they enter. Do you understand what I'm saying? The Bible says in righteousness you shall be established. I told people righteousness is not just a doctrine. It's a weapon. The armor of God. He calls it the breastplate of righteousness. Not your own righteousness, but the righteousness of God. It's a breastplate. It's a protective element. It's an armor. It's part of the force of the fullness of the armor of God. Knowing that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Somebody shout hallelujah. He says in Isaiah 54, he says in righteousness, you shall be established. And the Bible says, and thou shall be far from oppression. For thou shall not fear and from terror, for it shall not come nigh thee. Because you carry the righteousness which is of God, it was imputed on you, not because of what you did, but by what he did. And if they come, next verse, the Bible says, and behold, they shall surely gather together, but not by me. Whosoever shall gather together against thee, they shall fall for your sake. And the next verse says, For behold, I've created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire and bringeth forth the instrument for his work, and I've created the waster to destroy. He says, No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shall condemn. He says, This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, said the Lord. Who are you to lay another charge on another man's servant? For if he falls, he falls before God. And if he stands, he stands before God. And he says, but yeah, God shall hold on him up. He is able to make him stand. The Bible says, but yeah, he shall be holding up. For God is able to make him stand. You will stand. Tell your neighbor, you will stand. Are you enjoying the gospel? Psalm 71 verse 24. He says, my tongue, he says, shall talk of thy righteousness all day long. Of thy righteousness. Not my righteousness, but thy righteousness. If it's in your righteousness, the righteousness of God. Your righteousness is your own work. God's righteousness is what he imputes on you by faith in him. And he says, my tongue shall talk of thy righteousness. Not of my righteousness, but of thy righteousness all day long. And he says, for they are confounded. Who? Your enemies. Every time you impute righteousness on you and speak of the righteousness of God upon your life, Satan is confounded. They that hate you are confounded. Your weaknesses are confounded. Confounded means confused and put in disarray. The Bible says, for they shall be brought unto shame. They that seek to hurt you. There will be a shame. When weakness comes, always say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Your tongue should talk it every day. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Every time something happens and you feel it's not going the right way, say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. This is not me. I'm not a thief. I'm not perverse. I'm not a drunkard. I'm not a crazy person. The righteousness of God is in me and is working in me and through me to perfect me every other day, to get all this nonsense out of my life. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. There is nothing as powerful as being in the middle of a storm and you proclaim his righteousness off your tongue and say, I am the righteousness of God. A young girl approached me a couple of years ago and said, I have struggled with masturbation for more than eight years and I am convinced except the Lord come through I'll never stop masturbating. And I sat her down and I opened the scriptures and I showed her the righteousness of God. I didn't look at her sin. I looked at the righteousness of God. And I told her every morning, remind yourself. Whether you've done it or not, remind yourself you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And she sent me a message after six months. She just said, Apostle, it's been six months. And I've not done it again. 
I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The devil is disturbed when you say that statement. Because he wants to accuse you. Satan, the accuser of the brethren. I have good news for you. The smoldering wick, he will not burn out. A bruised reed, he shall not what? Break. He's not intending to break you because you're weak. If somebody said, I messed up, I'll never come back to ministry again. I told them, no. Let's restore you. Heal. You'll serve God again. There's still hope for you. And if you're standing, don't always take it in your own strength to think that you're standing in your own ability. Always remember that the grace of God is working through me. Every time I'm conscious of his righteousness upon me, I've realized that it's effortless to walk a righteous life. Forgive yourself. Some of you, because of your past story, you've failed to move on. I post, I messed up, I don't think I'll ever get married. I messed up, I don't think that I'll ever get a good man. I don't think I, I, I will ever do ministry again. I messed up, I don't think I'll ever get a wonderful wife. I mean, with everything I've done. Oh no, I deserve what I... Some foolish preacher one time, I use the word foolish because the Bible says the fool says no to God. He refuses the oracle of God and chooses to preach his own understanding. One man was in a preaching conference and he said, if you, you messed up, you're going to get a partner who is messed up. I said, wait a minute. This is not Jesus on the pulpit. These are doctrines of devils. These are doctrines of devils. If you messed up, you'll never serve God again. No. There is forgiveness with him. The Bible says in the book of Psalms that men might fear him. What am I trying to say? There is another chance for you. Move on, repent and move on. Don't submit yourself to the, to the mercy of men. Because their grace for you is over, they assume that God's grace for you is over. No, he understands and he will take you out. No man born of God can love to sin. No man born of the Spirit. In fact, if you're here and you take advantage of that grace to sin, Chances are you need to receive Jesus afresh tonight because 99.99% of the chances are that you're not born again. No man born of God loves sin. So Jesus understands. Somebody shout hallelujah. He understands. And his plan is simple. And I told people, as long as Fenera is still on the face of the earth, we did not bring you here to change you. We brought you here, here to give you Jesus and let Jesus do the change. My business here is not to change you. My business here is to give you Jesus and let Jesus change you. How many have understood this message and started to see yourselves walking out of things that you never imagined could leave you? Put up your hands. That's what I'm trying to talk about. And those hands go up every time I ask that question. Because I want that person who has just come here to know that there is hope even when you know you're dealing with something that you feel will never leave you. Infirmity, weakness, disease. There is nothing that Jesus does not understand. He will make a way out for you. Somebody shout hallelujah. He will make a way out for you. He will help you. He's able to succor those that come to him. He's able to help. He's able to aid those that come to him. That's why he says that until he brings justice and a just cause to victory. God is fighting for this week not to burn out until it's victorious. He's fighting for you to make sure that at the end of the day, when you stand before him, you will be perfect even as you are through him and that's the work of the church Paul says laboring and teaching in all wisdom the book of Colossians says that we might present men perfect in Christ that's the ministry 
of the church of Jesus. The church of Jesus was not called to point fingers. The church of Jesus was called for reconciliation. For to wit was God in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. The Bible says not counting their sins upon them. And Paul says, and now, brethren, we have been committed unto us the word of reconciliation. That's the word that we are supposed to be preaching because God has done that through Christ from the beginning of the world. He says, to it, God was in Christ reconciling the word unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. And what does the next verse say? And now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled. What's this reconciliation? God's hand will always be out here. Some people think, ah, oh, there's a time where God will say, I've closed my door. God will never close his door for you. He loves you unconditionally. God help me to love men unconditionally. His hand is always there. You know the story when he says that, Come, let us reason together, for even though your sins are as red as crimson, so I shall wash them as white as snow. When you read the context of Isaiah 118, it was giving a figure of a man who was walking away from God because he was laden with a lot of iniquity and judged himself of guilt. And as he walked away because he felt he deserved not the mercy of God, God still reaches out to him and tells him, Come now, let us reason together. For though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though ye be red like crimson, shall they be wool. I want to help you. But this was a man running away from God because he was guilty. Every time you run out of the presence of God because you made a mistake, you're telling him you can do better with your own strength. That's why I tell people, regardless of your weakness, never leave the presence of God. Mess up and come back. And you who are in the church, never make men feel like they don't deserve a place anymore in the presence of God because of their mistakes. What do you have that was not given? Even the worst of sinners, our doors should always be open for them because we don't know when God will change them and at what point they are with their God. But the Bible says, yeah, he will hold them up for he is able to make them stand. You remember that scripture in the message Bible? He says, if there are manners to learn, if there are rules to keep, he says, leave it to God. He speaks of some people who have gone ahead to judge. Yes. He says, do you have any business crossing people off the guest list or interfering with God's welcome? Romans 14 verse 4. Why do you always interfere with, I've seen churches, that one shouldn't enter. We have just out of church. She did this. No. I have released people myself out of this ministry. But you know how I've done it? I've not chased them out as bad people. I've simply told them, I'm not able. Let another man take over you. But I don't chase them out as the worst things the world has ever happened. I only sometimes come to the recognition that maybe I'm not the priest for this man. Maybe I'm not the priest for this woman because I've done everything I could as a priest and I've failed to help her. Can another priest take over? Some I even refer them to other men of God and I tell them, you know what, men of God, I've struggled with this person. I feel I can't get through. Help me. Maybe you have the grace for this individual. But even those we've released, I still have hope that God will help them. We were not called to cross people off the guest list or interfere with God's welcome. If there are any corrections to be made or manners to be learned, God can handle that without your help. Stop interfering in who did what and who didn't do what. Come to the presence of God. Raise your holy hands and tell him, God, you're awesome, you're holy, you're beautiful, I love you. It's none of my business with what Annette is dealing with. You are her God. You must love her more than I love her. Surely you have a plan to take her out. 
but some of you, you can't associate with some people, you can't talk with certain people, you can't relate to certain people, you can't even sit next to certain people, how wicked they are, how bad they are, they are this kind of people, you're crossing people off the list, and one day you're going to stand that day and discover you're not on the list. That's why heaven is going to shock men. The Bible says publicans are getting in heaven before you. And of all places Jesus chose to have a meal, he had it in the house of one Zachariah. The guy who had robbed the whole world. And Jesus says, I'm dining with you. And the Bible tells us, Jesus entered that man's house, Zacchaeus. And the Bible says, for today, he told him, I must abide in thine house. And the next verse says, and when he made his came down, received him joyfully. And the next verse says, and when they saw it, all of them what? But was going to be against you the man that is a sinner. Give me the message of that. Hey, hey, hey. hey. Everyone who saw the incident was indignant and grabbed. What business does he have getting cozy with his crook? And the Bible says, Jesus never judged Zacchaeus. He never spoke any evil about Zacchaeus. He didn't convict him. He just sat and ate food with the man. And as he was eating, Zacchaeus stood up. The Bible says, Zacchaeus stood up and stammered apologetically, Master, I give away half of my income to the poor, and if I'm caught cheating, I'll pay for time damages. And Jesus told Zacchaeus, Today salvation has come in your house. It did not come because he identified Zacchaeus' weakness. It came because he ate with a crook. Some people need only love, they'll reconcile with God. That is why I will preach this grace until the day I die. Until the day I leave this world, like the man sang, redeeming love shall be my theme until the day I die. I will never stand on the altar of God and take men off God's guest list. If you know the worst people in the world that you know those ones are stinky, they send them out of church, they messed up, bring them to Fanero. I have my mad people whom God has dealt with. There are people here I look at and I remember how they came. And sometimes I wonder and I'm like, God, if it was not for you. There's a man recently came to my office to testify. He told me, Apostle, I used to get crates of beer, throw them there. Tank finished it. I never used to get high. And then I came to Fanero. And then the beer has reduced. I didn't reduce them, no. They reduced. The beers started rejecting me. The man said, I'll take them and I vomit them. And told me now I don't drink. And I said, eh. <laughs> That is what we do every Thursday. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Before the throne of God above. Sing that song with me. I have a strong and perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love. Whoever lives and lives for me. Whoever lives and lives. I want you to sing that song like it's a confession of his righteousness. Don't just sing it. Sing it from your heart, okay? What do we let's go? Before the throne of God above, I have a strong perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love. Whoever lives in me for me, whoever lives in me for me. can be me he had when Satan tempts me to despair and tells me over guilt within me of what I look at be him there who made a name to all my sins who made a name I don't hear you Come on! Because the sinless thing. 
your healing now receive your healing now if you came on clutches I want you to exercise yourself without clutches do something you could not do walk if you must God is healing right now blind eyes are seeing deaf ears are hearing the sick are getting healed right now the sick are getting healed right now the sick are getting healed right now. The sick are getting healed right now. Thank you, Lord. If you are here and you have never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or you have been in your own strength and you have discovered today that you are not really born again tonight, you want to make it right, come here. 
If you have never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and today you say, ah, yeah, ah, yeah, yeah, I need to be serious. I need Jesus to take up. Oh, come. Jesus, Jesus, you're my friend forever. Come. He says, if you lift me up, I'll torment myself. Wow. I want you to repeat this one after me. Say, Jesus, I have come before you because tonight I realize without you, I am nothing. Without you, I can do nothing. It's not in my ability to do. I know you as a savior. But tonight, I also receive you as my Lord. Tonight, I am born again. I receive your strength. I receive your power. I receive your ability. I receive your life. In the mighty name of Jesus. The message you have Amen. just heard was brought to you by Sonero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at sonerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fonero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make nonsense.